Chapter 2.3 of the 9-11 Commission Report This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 2.3 The Rise of Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, 1988-1992 a decade of conflict in Afghanistan, from 1979 to 1989, gave Islamist extremists a rallying point and training field. A communist government in Afghanistan gained power in 1978, but was unable to establish enduring control. At the end of 1979, the Soviet government sent in military units to ensure that the country would remain securely under Moscow's influence. The response was an Afghan national resistance movement that defeated Soviet forces. Young Muslims from around the world flocked to Afghanistan to join as volunteers in what was seen as a holy war, jihad, against an invader. The largest numbers came from the Middle East. Some were Saudis, and among them was Osama bin Laden. Twenty-three when he arrived in Afghanistan in 1980, Bin Laden was the seventeenth of fifty-seven children of a Saudi construction magnate. Six feet five and thin, Bin Laden appeared to be ungainly, but was in fact quite athletic. Skilled as a horseman, runner, climber, and soccer player, he had attended Abu Aziz University in Saudi Arabia. By some accounts he had been interested there in religious studies, inspired by tape recordings of fiery sermons by Abdullah Azam a Palestinian and a disciple of Qutb. Bin Laden was conspicuous among the volunteers, not because he showed evidence of religious learning, but because he had access to some of his family's huge fortune. Though he took part in at least one actual battle, he became known chiefly as a person who generously helped fund the anti-Soviet jihad. Bin Laden understood better than most of the volunteers the extent to which the continuation and eventual success of the jihad in Afghanistan depended on an increasingly complex, almost worldwide organization. This organization included a financial support network that came to be known as the Golden Chain, put together mainly by financiers in Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states. Donations flowed through charities, or other non-governmental organizations, NGOs. Bin Laden and the Afghan Arabs drew largely on funds raised by this network, whose agents roamed the world markets to buy arms and supplies for the Mujahideen, or holy warriors. Mosques, schools, and boarding houses served as recruiting stations in many parts of the world, including the United States. Some were set up by Islamic extremists, or their financial backers. Bin Laden had an important part in this activity. He, and the cleric Azam, had joined in creating a Bureau of Services, Metab al Khidmat, or MAK, which channeled recruits into Afghanistan. The international environment for Bin Laden's efforts was ideal. Saudi Arabia and the United States supplied billions of dollars worth of secret assistance to rebel groups in Afghanistan fighting the Soviet occupation. This assistance was funneled through Pakistan, the Pakistani Military Intelligence Service, Inner Services Intelligence Directorate, or ISID, helped train the rebels and distribute the arms. But bin Laden and his comrades had their own sources of support and training, and they received little or no assistance from the United States. April 1988 brought victory for the Afghan Jihad. Moscow declared it would pull its military forces out of Afghanistan within the next nine months. As the Soviets began their withdrawal, the Jihad's leaders debated what to do next. Bin Laden and Azam agreed that the organization successfully created for Afghanistan should not be allowed to dissolve. They established what they called a base, or foundation, Al-Qaeda as a potential general headquarters for future jihad. Though Azam had been considered number one in the M.A.K., by August 1988, bin Laden was clearly the leader, emir, of al-Qaeda. This organization's structure included as its operating arms an intelligence component, 
a military committee, a financial committee, a political committee, and the committee in charge of media affairs and propaganda. It also had an advisory council, Shura, made up of bin Laden's inner circle. Bin Laden's assumption of the helm of al-Qaeda was evidence of his growing self-confidence and ambition. He soon made clear his desire for unchallenged control and for preparing the Mujahideen to fight anywhere in the world. Azam, by contrast, favored continuing to fight in Afghanistan until it had a true Islamist government, and, as a Palestinian, he saw Israel as the top priority for the next stage. Whether the dispute was about power, personal differences, or strategy, it ended on November 24, 1989, when a remotely controlled car bomb killed Azam and both of his sons. The killers were assumed to be rival Egyptians. The outcome left bin Laden indisputably in charge of what remained of the M.A.K. and Al-Qaeda. Through writers like Khutib, and the presence of the Egyptian Islamist teachers in the Saudi educational system, Islamists already had a strong intellectual influence on bin Laden and his al-Qaeda colleagues. By the late 1980s, the Egyptian Islamist movement, badly battered in the government crackdown following President Sadat's assassination, was centered in two major organizations, the Islamic Group and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. A spiritual guide for both, but especially the Islamic group, was the so-called blind sheik, Omar Abdel Rahman. His preaching had inspired the assassination of Sadat. After being in and out of Egyptian prisons during the 1980s, Abdel Rahman found refuge in the United States. From his headquarters in Jersey City, he distributed messages calling for the murder of unbelievers. The most important Egyptian in bin Laden's circle was a surgeon, Ayman al-Zawari, who led a strong faction of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Many of his followers became important members in the new organization, and his own close ties with bin Laden led many to think of him as the deputy head of al-Qaeda. He would in fact become bin Laden's deputy some years later, when they merged their organizations. Bin Laden Moves to Sudan by the fall of 1989, bin Laden had sufficient stature among Islamic extremists that a Sudanese political leader, Hassan al turabi urged him to transplant his whole organization to Sudan. Turabi headed the National Islamic Front in a coalition that had recently seized power in Khartoum. Bin Laden agreed to help Turabi in an ongoing war against African Christian separatists in southern Sudan, and also to do some road-building. Turabi, in return, would let bin Laden use Sudan as a base for worldwide business operations and for preparations for jihad. While agents of bin Laden began to buy property in Sudan in 1990, bin Laden himself moved from Afghanistan back to Saudi Arabia. In August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Bin Laden, whose efforts in Afghanistan had earned him celebrity and respect, proposed to the Saudi monarchy that he summon Mujahideen for a jihad to retake Kuwait. He was rebuffed, and the Saudis joined the U.S.-led coalition. After the Saudis agreed to allow U.S. armed forces to be based in the kingdom, bin Laden and a number of Islamic clerics began to publicly denounce the arrangement. The Saudi government exiled the clerics, and undertook to silence bin Laden by, among other things, taking away his passport. With help from a dissident member of the royal family, he managed to get out of the country under the pretext of attending an Islamic gathering in Pakistan in April 1991. By 1994, the Saudi government would freeze his financial assets and revoke his citizenship. He no longer had a country he could call his own. Bin Laden moved to Sudan in 1991 and set up a large and complex set of intertwined business and terrorist enterprises. In time, the former would encompass numerous companies and a global network of bank accounts and non-governmental institutions. Fulfilling his bargain with Turabi, bin Laden used his construction company to build a new highway from Khartoum to Port Sudan on the Red Sea coast. 
Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda finance officers and top operatives used their positions in bin Laden's business to acquire weapons, explosives, and technical equipment for terrorist purposes. One founding member, Abu Hajir al-Iraqi, used his position as head of a bin Laden investment company to carry out procurement trips from Western Europe to the Far East. Two others, Wadi al-Hagi and Mubarak Duri, who had become acquainted in Tucson, Arizona, in the late 1980s, went as far afield as China, Malaysia, the Philippines, and the former Soviet states of Ukraine and Belarus. Bin Laden's impressive array of offices covertly provided financial and other support for terrorist activities. The network included a major business enterprise in Cyprus, a services branch in Zagreb, an office of the Benevolence International Foundation in Sarajevo, which supported the Bosnian Muslims in their conflict with Serbia and Croatia, and an NGO in Baku, Azerbaijan, that was employed as well by Egyptian Islamic Jihad, both as a source and conduit for finances, and as a support center for the Muslim rebels in Chechnya. He also made use of the already established Third World Relief Agency, TWRA, headquartered in Vienna, whose branch office locations included Zagreb and Budapest. Bin Laden later set up an NGO in Nairobi as a cover for operatives there. Bin Laden now had a vision of himself as head of an international jihad confederation. In Sudan, he established an Islamic Army Shura that was to serve as the coordinating body for the consortium of terrorist groups with which he was forging alliances. It was composed of his own al-Qaeda Shura together with leaders or representatives of terrorist organizations that were still independent. In building this Islamic army, he enlisted groups from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, Oman, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Somalia, and Eritrea. Al-Qaeda also established cooperative but less formal relationships with other extremist groups from these same countries, from the African states of Chad, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, and Uganda and from the Southeast Asian states of Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Bin Laden maintained connections in the Bosnian conflict as well. The groundwork for a true global terrorist network was being laid. Bin Laden also provided equipment and training assistance to the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in the Philippines, and also to a newly formed Philippine group that called itself the Abu Sayyaf Brigade after one of the major Afghan jihadist commanders. Al-Qaeda helped Jemai Islamiyah, J.I., a nascent organization headed by Indonesian Islamists, with cells scattered across Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and the Philippines. It also aided a Pakistani group engaged in insurrectionist attacks in Kashmir. In mid-1991, bin Laden dispatched a band of supporters to the northern Afghanistan border, to assist the Tajikistan Islamists in the ethnic conflicts that had been boiling there even before the Central Asian departments of the Soviet Union had become independent states. This pattern of expansion through building alliances extended to the United States. A Muslim organization called al Khifa had numerous branch offices, the largest of which was in the Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn. In the mid-1980s it had been set up as one of the first outposts of Azam and bin Laden's M.A.K. Other cities with branches of al Khifa included Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Tucson. al Khifa recruited American Muslims to fight in Afghanistan. Some of them would participate in terrorist actions in the United States in the early 1990s and in al-Qaeda's operations elsewhere, including the 1998 attacks on U.S. embassies in East Africa. End of chapter 2.3